I'm director of The Hub. Most of you, I think, will probably know a little bit about us, but uh, just very quickly, we're a social enterprise. We work exclusively in the arts, in the creative sector, and uh, we do two things. We do all the kinds of things that a normal consultancy firm would do, so strategy and research and all those sorts of things for organisations like the Arts Council and the BBC. Um, but we take the proceeds that we make from all of that work with those people and plough it into projects of our own that we think are important and that can do some good in the world. And this is one of those projects. So it's lovely to see you here today. I was saying earlier, um, might be a bit late to say Happy New Year, but um, I haven't seen some of you yet this year. So Happy New Year on the 24th of February. Um, I just want to introduce uh, my partner in crime today, Andy Gibson. Um, Andy is head gardener at Mind Apples. I don't know if you want to say a quick word about Mind Apples, Andy. Yes, hello. Nice to be back with you. And um, it feel, feels like it was only recently we were we were dancing to Christmas songs, and yet and yet here, here we are. And I can't believe it's February. It does feel like it's sort of Happy New Year back to all of you. Nice to see everyone. Um, so, Mind Apples for anyone who's not been to one of our sessions before. We help people to take better care of their minds and try and uh, increase public understanding of how our minds work. So, a lot of our work is public health related. We've, our, our charity is doing a lot of work, particularly in schools at the moment and universities. Um, and then we have a commercial side that, that provides well-being training and uh, management support, all kinds of different things for businesses to help them to make their organisations into places where people can thrive rather than just survive. And um, we've actually just launched an app. So that's one of the things I think some of you may know about it because uh, Julia was kindly putting that out on the um, some of the newsletters. But um, uh, we released that early so that we can provide a bit of support during this this long, long COVID lockdown. And so the, the whole first module, the Feed Your Mind module, is, is free. So if you just search for Mind Apples on Android or iOS you can get that as well so it gives you a bit of a sense of what we are what we're up to at the moment. It's brilliant I know I probably shouldn't say this but when I listened to it I thought oh it's like having Andy in my pocket. So Is that um, good? Is yeah that it was really good so okay. uh, maybe that could be your strap line yeah it's like having Andy in your pocket. <laughs> Anyway, um, so yes, this is the first Balance Talk of 2021. Um, Balance is a, a, a project that we've been running since June or July last year. I can't quite remember when it was that we launched. And the idea behind it is that we are supporting creative freelancers and entrepreneurs to balance your mind so that you can balance your books. You know, if you're not healthy yourselves, how on earth can you have a healthy career? or run a successful business. Um, we're doing that in partnership with uh, the Creative, in Creative Industries Federation, as Abby said. Uh, it's been great working with them over the last few months. And we're really excited this, for this talk is the first in a whole series of new bits of work that we're gonna be doing thanks to an Arts Council lottery, uh, Arts Council England lottery grant. So we're really pleased to have that Arts Council support as well. Um, so, Today is our first balance talk of February of 2021. It's February, it's nice to see everyone. And we thought when we were planning this that it would be good to focus on um, how we can pick ourselves up, how we can cope with disappointment and how we can kind of find and hold on to hope. It's been a really long slog, but there's, it feels like there's light at the end of the tunnel. I think it does uh, at this end. So we thought it would be useful just to think a little bit about how we can keep ourselves going and support each other through this next phase. And I, when I've been thinking about this talk, the way that I've been thinking about it is, it's all about working out how we can stick with things when we might be feeling a bit stuck ourselves. That's the way that it's, it's made sense to me. So we're gonna try and find some answers uh, together. I can't say that Andy and I have all the answers, but I'm sure between us, uh, all of us here today, we will have a good go at coming up with some. So to kick us off, Andy, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about motivation. Um, I know we've talked about motivation before and what the components are of it, but I want to talk now about perhaps when we don't have quite that level of motivation that some of us had, you know, when all of this started, when we almost had that kind of blitz spirit so when we don't have motivation, when we're feeling perhaps a bit sluggish, how, how do we keep going? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that we talked previously about motivation in, in, in an earlier session, but it is it is always that question of, you know, it, do we have it? It's this wonderful aspiration. Oh, it would be great to feel motivated. I wonder what that would be like. And then let's go back to all of the stuff that I actually have to do. And um, 
uh, to, to recap for any, any of you who weren't there at that, that session, motivation is probably best defined as being eager to act. It's like it comes from the idea of movement. So it's it's that feeling when your, your mind is sort of already off and, and doing something before you've even thought about it. And, and so, for example, you, you may find that you are so desperate to go for a run that you're just already doing it. You can your, your body is already getting ready to go running as you start to try and make justifications for why you should not to do the other things because you want to go running now whereas of course you can have the opposite effect where you feel like I, I, everything feels like a struggle to you know getting to change to go running you have to talk yourself into it and so a lot of our experience of not having motivation is of that self-talk of feeling like we need to talk to ourselves to tell us that something is a good idea force ourselves to do it and that that dissonance I suppose between the kind of the the impulses that we have and uh, the, the intellectual decisions that we've that we've made and it, it, that that disconnect uh, um, is is tiring and that's the kind of the the headline with it is that it requires a lot more energy to drag yourself through things that you don't really have the motivation to do and um, what what we generally see is you can do that in the short term but what what starts to happen is it's it's tricky to maintain it in the long term and so what you can do is is that kind of quick burst of I'm just going to get through today but then it's it's just every day is like that it starts to mount up it starts to feel like every day is feeling a bit like that and so one thing that we haven't talked about much is not just sort of motivation in the short term for what you're doing right now but a sense of forward momentum a sense of progress and one of the things that seems to really help people to maintain that grit, that determination to keep going is uh, a sense that the work is paying off. That The more you drag yourself through it, the better things get. If you keep forcing yourself to go running, you notice that you get fitter. And so then you feel like it's easier to keep expending the energy, but the intellectual case starts collapsing for it. If you feel like every day is just the same, I'm not going anywhere with it. This energy isn't going on anything useful. So there's partly, I suppose, think of it as those two, two sides of it, the immediate immediate motivation for what you've got to do right now and then the longer term motivation of, of like what what is the task that you're actually trying to pursue overall in the long term how does this actually result in a better a better future that that's often the bit that we need to work a bit more on I think what's interesting there when you were talking about the sort of setting of long-term goals is it made me think about being your own line manager so if you were in a team, if you were, you know, if you had in, you know, inverted commas, a normal job, you'd have a line manager, you'd have a weekly check in or a one to one. But actually, if it's just you, then one of the things that I often think about is how can I be, how can I employ myself well? And, 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 and that when you were talking about that made me think about that idea of just talking about where you're going, trying to remind yourself of what the purpose is, that sort of thing. It feels like there's an element of that in there as well. Yeah, I think it's it's part of the role. When, when we do managers sport, we do a lot of programs with managers at the moment. And there is a, a general sense, I think, amongst managers, at least in the clients we work with, that uh, they want to support people. They want to help people to be OK because they're worried about their teams. That, and teams are generally sort of trying to bond together and support each other. Um, and and it, it's, it's one of the challenges of being freelance or being an entrepreneur is that you have to take that sort of sense of support network and that camaraderie, not just the manager, I think, but also teammates and colleagues that that's you need to find other ways to get that sense of other people helping guide you and figure out what you need to do and and feeling like you, you set goals and move towards it and you can absolutely can do it for yourself it just requires a kind of a bit of understanding of how to do that well if you've had a lot of management experience you might well know how to manage yourself but if you've not really done that in your job then it's it's trying to figure out some of these levers that work on you setting setting yourself goals and rewards and and these kinds of things are quite common you know i think the example i've often cited is um, someone i spoke to who was doing his master's thesis and he arranged with one of his his colleagues that um they uh would uh, meet up in the pub remember those remember pubs and they would uh, uh they would compare word counts every friday and then whoever had written the fewest number of words would then have to buy all the drinks and so they were they were kind of managing each other they were being each other's supervisors but <clears throat> you can do it at peer-to-peer -peer level and you can do it for yourself as well but it's often that social dimension that sense of other people are in this with me or we're all working towards a common thing that that we really need yeah one of the things that i was going to ask people to to just share if they're willing to in the chat is just a sense of whether people have been struggling with motivation um you know since coming back in the new year it feels to me like that from the conversations that i've been having that's the case um so if you uh, are up for sharing that then you know just a sense of 
you know what what maybe what you're what you're talking immediate, immediate response yes, there. Yes, yes yes oh yes oh no uh. it's not only me um but i'm interested not just in whether people have been struggling with that but you know what they've been doing to kind of deal with that so one of the things that i've been talking to my friends about doing is having like a monday motivator because i've been finding monday mornings really really tricky so well why don't we just get together for 20 minutes and we'll just talk about what we're going to do and how we're going to maybe support each other or what we've got to look forward to that sort of thing so it'd be great to get a little bit of chat going in the the room while we're doing that I, I read something um the other day that i thought was really interesting it's, which was around this idea that it doesn't matter whether you're burnt out or starting out or whether you're really successful the big question every day is how do you keep going and that that's true that, that was so so liberating for me. it's like even if you're really really successful if everything's going great you've still got to think how am i going to turn up tomorrow and carry on being this great or whatever so that, like that i found that quite a comforting sort of sort of idea um andy i just wanted to talk a little bit about um you talked before about there being three factors that motivate us and you i think they were something like it was about an inner drive and there being an incentive and then this sense of confidence that you can achieve it um could you talk a little bit more about those factors in in, in motivation yeah, and like we can recap those, and then it might be worth saying a bit about willpower as well, because yeah. you know, it's sort of they're slightly different in terms of things that actually give you motivation. The, the tasks that you'll find energizing generally, there's a combination of some kind of incentive, a thing that makes it pressing or urgent or timely to do it. So something in the world around you that means if I do this now, then I'll get this result. Like you've got a deadline or a funder has given you some cash to do a particular project. So you go, okay, that goes to the, the top of the pile. Then that's, that's the thing I need to focus on. But you also need some sense that it's the right thing for you to do some inner drive and connection to it. And so um, sometimes we have an incentive to do things, but we think this isn't my sort of thing. I wish someone else would do this. Whereas other things you think, I don't want other people to get that task. I want that one for myself because that's my sort thing I could really do that um, and then you need to feel able to do it well and I think where a lot of us have been stuck a lot in the last year has not been in the <clears throat> incentives or the desire to do it but in just feeling that there are too many impediments there's not enough resources that there's too many obstacles in the way and and so that that's often I think what's been causing that lack of motivation it's not that we don't love what we do it's not that we don't have an incentive to try and make it work as a business it's just so many things being thrown at us that hits us in that sense of capability um, and of course one of the things that that does is create stress as well because if you feel like you you've got to do this and it's urgent and vital and you really care about it and you can't that that can be quite a stressful place to be and sometimes that demoralization comes from trying to protect ourselves from being stressed we're just getting so upset about it so anxious about these things you just start going you know what i just can't do anything about this i'm just gonna go and watch watch netflix i just don't care anymore and it's it's often that's that self-defense mechanism yeah um, wow that sounds like last week <laughs> <That's great. laughs> there's some great stuff coming in on the chat you know uh, people are going to writers rooms do some great stuff i'm already pleased that we did this because there's some great tips in there Posit somebody's writing a po positive poem every day i know loads of people have been relying on poetry somebody's joined some other peer support groups um cat's got a quote next to a bed that essentially tells me to get out of bed <laughs> Um, I, I um, read the other day that um, Leonardo da Vinci, he used to start every day with his today I'm going to learn list. Like, mm. So he had a to learn list. And I was thinking, God, actually, what we all do is we reach for our phones and just look at like the, ne the next bit of, you know, doom that's coming from somewhere. So I thought that was such an interesting sort of compare and contrast. So thank I've, you I've, for sharing those. Sorry. I found, I found like I start my, I've, I've certainly got into a habit of starting my day by looking at Twitter and finding something to be annoyed about. I don't know if that's helping me. It's certainly that uh, Christopher Hitchens used to do that. He used to start the day by reading the horoscope page in the Washington Post, not because he believed in astrology, but because it annoyed him so much that the Washington Post had a horoscope page. And so it would give him that impetus to go out and fight things. You know? But I mean, he wasn't necessarily a model of good health, I would say. <laughs> But, you know, mm. anger can be motivating sometimes. Um, it can, yeah. I mean, some of this is about that grit and determination. I mean, this is what we, we, we're going to talk about a bit is sort of the things that give you a bit of willpower. Mm. Um, be, because it, it, it does it does feel like sometimes that energy is what you need to, to overcome the inertia, you know, that you need to get that kind of bit of, uh, of sort of, actually, I want things to be different. I am going to change things. I'm going to try and try and do stuff. And, and sometimes that can be enough to carry you through. But there is a, I think there's a hopefulness to anger and we'll talk about hope later I'm sure but th there's an element of thinking I can affect change here and actually I, I see a world where things could be better and so I'm going to put that into action and so there, there is an element even within that anger of feeling like 
you you have a vision of how things could be improved and a sense of how to get there and so a lot of it is that capability thing again not just purposeless anger of feeling frustrated or overwhelmed but actually that's got on my nerves I'm going to try and do something about that it's a very different type of engagement with anger and and so that the thing around willpower um it, that's partly about then connecting it with your passion so that you you're, there's a motivation to to go out and, and do something yeah, some of this is about short term versus long term payoffs. So there are plenty of things that actually in terms of the long term goal, we do have passion for it, but the short term bit we don't. And so it's trying to make that connection that I need to do this because this is, will contribute to this thing I do care about. And so, so one of the tasks that people have sometimes done to boost motivation and is to write down how this task that you're doing connects to your goals and to your values. Because actually, if you can see that, you know, pay, paying your staff is a, actually a reflection of your values and like trying to run a professional business, you start going, oh, maybe I should get out of bed and pay my staff, you know, because actually there are usually reasons for these things. And it's that, it's that lo loss of connection that's the problem, not that there's no reason to do a lot of these simple tasks. It's just that your mind on some level doesn't connect it to the thing it, it's it's attached to um so kids who did that in science classes for example they did this with kids in america got them to write out how science connected to the things they cared about and what they wanted to do in the future and those kids were then a lot more motivated to study science because they could see how it connected to things that they care about um, another thing is about choice and so one of the thing advantages that you do have if you don't have a manager and you do manage yourself um is that you can on some level at least sense that this is your choice to do this and you're in charge and you can plan it and that sense of choice and autonomy seems to help us buy into tasks even if you give people quite an arbitrary choice of just a couple of different very similar things the sense of i've picked this this is my thing it is enough to drive you through so sometimes it's about trying to think well, what, what have i chosen here what have i what 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 choices have led me to needing to do my my tax return you know for to take a recent example and it's and the choices are i wanted to have more independence it's like oh god i've got this independence and now i have to write a tax return this is a price of independence and you have to try and connect that to like actually it's nicer to do that than to have have a boss and so a lot of it's about that but the big number one one thing with it really is is you get more willpower if you um if you believe that you can you can exert willpower so a lot of this is just that sense of do you have faith in yourself to be able to stick at things so looking back at times in your life where you haven't had motivation and you've kept going and you've got a result those things i think are the the, the bits where you can kind of take take solace and think maybe i have a bit more capacity than i thought because i remember that time when i was studying for this or there was that really difficult time with that project and you sort of look back and you go hey, actually yeah maybe maybe I, I have got a bit more in me than, than i thought so that sense of connection to your values is really important that sense of choice and feeling it's, it, it's your thing and that sense of self-efficacy that belief that actually you have you have that grit in you that ability to be able to persist that's that's great. I read a great. Um, I'm I'm a bit. Um, I love words, and so quite often when I'm doing workshops with people, I will really get them to be really granular and think about the precise words that they're using. And I, I came across a great one the other day where somebody had changed the spelling of success to S U C K C E S S, and they were they were differentiating between that version of success, which is like you know you've achieved something you were supposed to, but you don't really care. It's just some. It's just a task you were given. Like you've but there's no purpose, it doesn't connect with your purpose versus the kind of really authentic success, which is spelt correctly. Um, and I thought that was such a nice kind of different, you know, cause sometimes you can feel like you've achieved something, but it doesn't really motivate. It doesn't feel very motivating to it. Like your tax return, for instance, that's just, it's that's S-U-K success, isn't it? That's that version of success rather than, yeah, I suppose some of it you can take pride in doing it really well. I mean, I think that's the thing is often trying to find a way to make it feel like your sorts of sort of thing. Though. So, I mean, for, for me, one of the things that I, I started to try and take pride in is that I, I like to submit the Mind Apples accounts early. And I don't like it when we're late, when we're still close to the wire. I quite like to feel like we're an organization that's ahead of ourselves. We're on top of it. And so I do feel a sense of pride if we manage to file our accounts, you know, uh, on, only a few months, uh, you know, uh, after the, the year's ended. I feel like, yes, this is the kind of organization I want us to be. It's not like I'm particularly proud of the accounts themselves. It's that I try and take some, some kind of solace in the way that we work, it, not so much the thing that we've done, but... The, if the way that we work feels professional and, and controlled and, and high quality, that's enough to make me feel like even the boring tasks are 
have some satisfaction to them so sometimes it's p- picking that that sense of value connection to it you know i i tidy the house because i'm the sort of person who likes to have a, a clean and, and welcoming environment you know that that connection to something that means something to you even if the task itself is boring and mundane it can still speak to something that you think is important and, and matters in the world so there's a sense there i think then of you know just how important that word why is so maybe it's worth us having, you know, why am I doing this stuck to our wall and just asking ourselves that, you know, at the start of every day, why are we, why am I doing this? Maybe that's a, a good yeah. way to kind of motivate ourselves. I don't know if having like a, a sign on your wall <laughs> when you get up in the morning, just going, why? why? It's like, I, I don't know. I could try it. We could try that. You know, but, um, but yeah, but, no, it's yeah. It, uh, ab- absolutely. And, and some, some of this is about working back to, to the principles that, that, that got you started in it. We sort of lose sight of why we're doing things. And it just sort of feels like I'm just, I'm just doing this because I need to get through the day. And then you have to step back a bit and go, hang on, what, what, what is the reasoning why I've ended up in this position? But I also saw, I mean, there was a comment from Bex earlier on the chat about rest and things. And one of the things we do is we overestimate how much willpower we have. And so actually it's very easy to hit a wall with it. One of the things that really seems to help with resisting temptation, for example, is not being tempted. Like, so trying to manage your situation to make it easier to do the things you want to do and harder to do the things you don't want to do. And it's very, very easy to hit a wall and, to, and the idea of rest as a part of recovery rather than just trying to push on and then slowing down and grinding out just to go actually part of what I'm going to do as my self-discipline as like trying to get through this is to allow myself some time to rest get my energy back and come back to this a bit more capable yeah I remember you talking about that before and it, and it always reminds me when I hear you talk about that about this um I always feel like I have sort of an, an emergency box that has an emergency supply of energy in it but I could like only go in there very very infrequently and if I feel like I'm raiding my energy box I will literally talk to myself in those terms then I just know that I'm in trouble because the box will be empty you know it's like a, yeah. and I can visualize it it's like a little kind of metal 19 1940s <laughs> it's got a red cross on it I know exactly what it looks like I've seen myself opening it a bit that's too fantastic often. So, I mean the, the, the classic study on this I think we talked about is the marshmallow test which is always worth looking at it's, um, the thing that's worth bearing in mind with the marshmallow test is that um so the classic thing is you give kids a marshmallow and tell them not to eat it and then they have to delay gratification for a few minutes and then if they're successful in resisting the temptation they get they get two marshmallows they get a, get a reward um the the one thing about that is that the kids they, they repeated that experiment more recently and the kids kids were given an experience of an unreliable adults first and the kids that had the experience of adults not following through on their promises were much more likely to eat the marshmallow now because they didn't believe that there was actually something good coming later. And so it makes sense to just grab what you've got right now. So it's that part of this is about feeling that the, the work is worthwhile, that actually resisting, grat- you know, delaying gratification um, it will actually pay off, that there is some, some kind of um, benefit to it. The other thing about it, though, is that the thing, the reason we all know, we, we talk about that test is because the videos of the kids are so funny and the kids trying to resist marshmallows is just hilarious because we empathize with them. And that, what that says is actually, it's really hard to resist marshmallows. They're tasty. It's really difficult for us to do that. And that's why we empathize with the kids because we really struggle with, with exerting that kind of delay of gratification. I know I have this sense that next time we should all rock up with some marshmallows to see how, see how that goes. So maybe we'll do that, I don't know. Um, I want to move us on a little bit. This is, this is something that, uh, this is a question that I'm really interested to hear the answer to. Um, and so we've talked about, you know, how to persevere, how to keep going when you're, you're stuck, that's the thing. But what happens, what if you're, if you're persisting with something that just isn't sensible? You know, if you're hanging on to like a fixed view of the world or of your career or, or, or your business or, or just even your productivity, maybe at a time like this, that isn't very realistic or very healthy at the moment, then surely sometimes the answer is actually in not sticking it out in changing I, i'm really interested to hear what you think about that yes the question of whether we're we're just crazy for sticking at these things or or, or um or if we're, we're geniuses mad, mad or genius is the often the question i mean I, I remember meeting a guy years ago who worked for ray dolby invented dolby stereo and he said you could read ray dolby's book and get a sense of you know just how how much he struggled to get the business off the ground and all that but what you do, wouldn't get from reading it is actually from knowing him through that is that there were points where he just thought he'd lost his mind and wasted his entire life. He was like, I've spent years on this, no one cares, 
this is a disaster. I have, I've completely ruined my life with this nonsense. I am insane. And then would sort of still find a way of persisting. And eventually it all works out. And now he looks like a genius, but he was, he always felt all the way through his career that he was, he wasn't sure if he was doing the wrong thing by persisting. And it's very difficult to know that what, what, what constitutes a good thing to stick at. Part of it is that sense that you can see movement. You can see that sense of going in the right direction. So we, we may not have much of a sense of what we're doing to contribute to ending the pandemic, but we can see movement. We can see some things in, you know, they, they were, they're slower than we would like, but we can see some movement towards it. It's not that unrealistic to say that we will get back to the point where we could do the things that we used to do. Whereas if we got, you know, all the vaccines had 30% efficacy, we might well be foolish to think that. We might well be thinking we need to change the way that we interact for a good few years. So there's definitely that sense of what, what what's the the forward momentum with it um but I, I i think part of it is about what you're feeling fixed about what you're attached to because sometimes we can get attached to the way that we would like things to be but not because we know that that would make us happy but just because it's familiar or because it's safer or because we understand it better and actually there may well be a better way of achieving the, the thing that we want or something even more interesting or more fulfilling that we're denied access to because we're so busy trying to preserve what we've got so a question that, that I've, I've often tried to ask is is what's what is the actual success underlying it's not the goals that we've got so if the goal is you know I, we want to get our app launched you know that's a that's a good tangible goal but actually supposing what one of the things that we've, we've had is we, are, we have the word apple in our name so one of the things i've been trying to manage is getting apple to approve an app with the word apple in the the brand name which which is not an easy thing to do and so all the way through it, we've had this possibility that maybe we won't be able to launch our app so I've had to have this sense of if we can't do that, is that the end of that project? Are we failing at that point? Or could we change the way that we deliver the app, change the name, change the deployment of it, change the graphics, and it still feel like a Mind Apple's app? Or could we take all the content, all the work that we've done and deploy it in, in other ways as e-learning, as, as other sorts of services? So you've got to be willing to say, my particular plan hasn't worked, but the overall goal is still solid that I'll just try and get there a different way or I'll try and get there with a slightly different approach. And that that's the thing to, to separate out when you're getting too, too attached to kind of almost arbitrary things or the way that you'd like it to go rather than the actual bit that you'd really like that, that you think will make you happy. You know, is it about wanting to spend more time with people or, or is it about wanting to get away from screens or is it about being able to, to feel financially secure again? What, what are the bits that you actually need to persist at and then let the rest go? Don't waste lots of energy persisting at things that actually it doesn't really matter in the long long term scheme of things you won't you won't feel satisfied when you achieve that because it's not really the thing that you're pointing at but i mean it's, it's worth asking a question for you because i mean I, I feel like i've persisted at things mind apples has been a bit like that there, there was a point where i felt completely crazy that in fact that i can pinpoint it actually there was a point where we did a pop-up health farm back in 2010 uh where um we turfed a gallery we put the whole gallery with real grass uh, and it was an amazing thing. It made the whole gallery smell beautiful and we had a little pop-up health farm in it. Um, but there was a point where the turf got delivered and the guy who was supposed to open the gallery hadn't arrived. And so the pallets of turf had to be unloaded onto the, onto the street in St. Martin's Lane, I think it was. So we were, we were at, like in the heart of London blocking all of the pavements and there was a guy from the council came along to ask what we were going to do. And so there was a possibility we were all going to get fined. We were going to spend thousands of pounds clearing this turf away. And I thought, I've lost my mind. I'm just having a nervous breakdown, aren't I? I'm sitting here <laughs> with my made up project surrounded by pallets of turf and I'm losing my mind. This is, this is what a breakdown looks like. And then the gallery <laughs> opened up and it was all fine. So it was all right again, you know. But I'm curious to know whether you've had moments like that. Are there things that you've persisted at, Julie, where you thought I'm mad and, and that have turned out to be right? And also things where you've had to give up. Where, have you had similar experiences to that? Yeah, I mean, every week almost. I mean, not quite every week, but I remember... Um, a few years ago uh, I had a coach I was given a coach through a cultural leadership program and I and uh, I can't remember her name now which is probably just as well but she's just known in our house as scary coach and um, she congratulated me on she said something like I have to congratulate you on your persistence and your energy or, or I have to comment or remark on it and I thought she was paying me a compliment but actually what she then went on to say was that 
I kind of hurl myself at these walls uh, because I, they're, you know, the wall representing the thing that I want to do. And I am just absolutely determined to break that wall down. Um, and she said, but sometimes there's a door. And if you just kind of looked a bit further along the wall, there'd be a door that you could get through really easily rather than just having to hurl yourself at the door. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm not known as a quitter. And, and uh, you know, this idea of even just that phrase, giving up on something makes me feel a little, a little bit weird. But I think I'm a bit like you. I think what I do is I, I'm not sure that even when I stop doing something, I really give up on it. I think I put it in another box which is that I don't know, the time will probably come box and it's just there and it's just kind of, you know, at the back of my mind kind of wearing away. Um, so I think when I, I don't think I give up. I think what I do is I look for other ways of doing it. I look for ways that I can maybe tweak it so that it feels more manageable or, or more doable. Um, so this, I mean, this project is, a, is an example of this. You know, um, we found out that we'd, uh, we'd got some uh, new funding from the Arts Council just before Christmas. And I remember talking to you and I before we knew whether we got the fund that you know, to, 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 we were talking. And we said, well, we'll just get cracking just before Christmas. We were really, and we were both really tired. And so quite sensibly, given that this is about the mental health, we thought, well, maybe we shouldn't do that and run ourselves into the ground. So we've kind of shifted things back a little bit. But I learned, I think, my lesson a few years ago. This is, a, uh, this is the analogy that I come back to a lot. I had, we, we were doing a really big project called Joining the Dots, which was all about independent music and new business models. And I hadn't managed to raise all of the money that we wanted to, that we needed to do it. Um, so we had a kind of vision of this project, which was a three bedroom house version of the project. And we only had enough money to build a one bedroom flat version of it. But we absolutely pushed through and we went on to try and build that three bedroom house. And that was such, that's, a, that's where I got it wrong. I should totally have gone with the, what does the one bedroom flat version look like? So yeah. It's, but like, it's, yeah. I suppose it's part of that question of what what's the what what is the realistic appraisal of what you can achieve and what you can't. So it, it is tricky, particularly. I mean, as a couple of you said in the, in the chat as well, like it's when you when you're feeling low, when you're going kind of down and tired, it feels like you haven't got much capability, not much you can do, and it can feel like things are impossible. Which on another day, another situation, or with a bit of help or a bit more energy, you might think, actually, no, I can see a way of doing this. So what you don't want to do is give up on things just because you feel wrongly that it is impossible what you've got to do is try and get a sense of realism about actually is this a sensible thing to try and do i mean i i've i've tried it over the years to have big ambitions but like realistic appraisal of how much i can do to to do it myself and so trying not to connect the overarching ambition to my bit of it uh, because what you can end up with is then a situation where say for example you know we're trying to mainstream the idea of looking after our minds uh, we could be a huge organization with lots of staff doing tube advertising and, and, and making documentaries, all kinds of things. Or we could try and influence the conversations so that other organizations start doing that. And so when I see another mental health charity using the line, we all have mental health, which I, I know I used to go to their conferences and tell them all that that is a good line and you should say that. When I see them doing that, I think, yes, okay, we won. It may not be a direct link and it may not be that we became this huge organisation, but I can still feel like the, we're getting closer to that goal. And so I guess it's trying to think, there's always things I want to achieve and then there's what I want to do day to day and the two don't have to be the same thing. I can work towards a longer term goal of these big things, but I can still have a nice day and and you know work in a reasonable way and not try and do everything that's that separation has helped me um I, yeah I, and i think tracy makes a good point there in the chat about you know you shouldn't take the no's and the rejections personally you know i've been in workplaces where you know you can have the same conversation with two people and one person will take the conversation so personally and the relationship just goes sour so i think that's a really important thing the the other thing that works for me is thinking about the cost so um not thinking about this it took me years to figure this out probably I wasn't in my mid until I got into my mid-30s that I figured it out but this idea that um your the work that you do is somehow different from the life that you're leading and so thinking about yes this might be this might mean success in a work contest but what's it going to do how's it going to impact on me in the the bigger scheme of things what's the cost of it to me yes of course I could do that I could work all those hours I could do it but what's the cost Mm. that's another thing that kind of checks me a little bit because in my mind I can do anything and I can convince anyone of anything that's not always healthy 
Yeah, and a lot of this is just that that realism thing again of what what you what you can do with it, knowing that you might need other people to do things as well, and that's okay. You know, that's 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 all right to want to to do your little contribution to it, um, and and move the problem forward. But I think we one of the things that I try to do is put energy where there is energy coming back, because I think that helps with that. So it's very easy to think I would like to do this list of things. Um, but actually, what do other people want me to do? What are other people thinking about? Because actually what you end up with then is um, quite, you know, you, you end up with thinking, well, I'll try to do this, but then actually no one cares. And then this thing that I didn't think was that big a deal, lots of people have said, oh, you should do that. Or actually there's a funder who wants to fund it. And you think, oh, maybe there's more to that than I think. And so some of it's about not just thinking that your opinion is the only one that counts about what's worth doing, that actually you can treat all of that as feedback on, checking whether your ideas are good, whether you're being realistic about it. And if you find that lots of people really think this thing that you didn't really notice was a brilliant idea, then maybe trust them a bit and go, okay, maybe there's more life in that than I thought. That's certainly what I did with Mind Apples. I used to have this thing called the nag test where I would tell people about ideas that I wanted to do. And then I would see who nagged me about which ones. And people kept coming up to me and saying, yeah, that, that Mind Apples idea you had, Andy, was the, are you doing anything with that? Because that was a good idea. And that, that it tells me maybe this is one of the better ideas and some of the other stuff I thought wasn't so good. And so I put more energy into that. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great idea. It's a great, the nag test, I like that. I like that one. And also, you know, if people like it, then it becomes fun because you can do it with people that you want to work with and it becomes a collaborative thing. And that's always more fun, isn't it? Um, I want to um, talk a little bit about disappointment. So, you know, we've both been running companies for a long time. We've had our fair, fair share of kind of setbacks and things like that. But the pandemic is obviously taking its toll on us in, in different ways. I mean, you know, everybody's having, as we've said before, a very different experience of this, different kinds of losses difficulties that sort of thing so how do we um learn to cope better with that loss and, and disappointment that so many of us are experiencing even now yeah it's, it's one of those things where i suppose this, this is the harder stuff where you just have to think i'm not going to be able to do the thing that i i wanted to do and um i feel i i mean i should confess i feel a bit of, of worry talking about it because i did try and write some things about grief and loss in my my last book in the mind manual and that was one of the only bits of negative feedback i got that someone said that that part was trite and quite thin and i thought i looked back and i thought yeah it all feels trite all this advice that we can give at this point does feel a bit like well you know it's it's all very nice to say that but it, it just it still feels terrible it still sucks you know um I suppose the anatomy of loss the psychology of it a lot of it is about the disconnect between reality and expectations you know it's about whether you feel um that you are um still kind of attached to this other state that you wish was there and still trying to live in that world rather than being able to move forward and um there's been a, been a few a few things that I've heard people say about that one one thing that resonated with me that stuck with me for a long time is um it's not a particularly scientific thing but it's, it's quite an interesting advice someone told me that the reason people get stuck and struggle to change is either deep fear or deep love so essentially a strong attachment to the thing that you miss or that you wish you had or that you, you want back or a fear of the future and of the, the possibility of things not being as good in in the in the new world and so that question of like is it what is the thing that you're dealing with just missing or you know, feeling the uh, uh, sadness that you haven't got this thing that you used to have or is it a trepidation of the the, the thing that you might have in replace of it and, and both can be different in the way that they make you feel and so part of it is just about trying to figure out how to just separate those out and I think a lot of the time the fear bit is easier to let go of if you're fearful of what the future holds that's easier to work on and to try and move towards and to try and get reassurance make plans figure out what you can do to feel like you've got a safe landing spot that there is some things that you can do later that are good the bit that's harder to let go of I think is is the, the thing that you're attached to from the past because it means something it matters it matters that we we miss these things and that we feel this this loss we don't necessarily want to just let go of that because it's showing us what we think is important and actually could probably inform what we take plans ahead to try and do next not to recapture it but to try and learn from what we loved about that and then try and get other things that create that feeling or have some of those features so i would i would certainly suggest try to identify what the fears are 
but also honor the sadness, honor the, the that, that feeling of, of of losses and regret, because I think that's I think it's important. I think it's important to be human, you know. And that thing around fear, just identifying those fears. Um, is there something in there about just looking at which of those are real and which of those are just, you know, part and parcel of the loss, you know, this sense of, well, I can't deal with that. I can't, but actually if you think about, okay, what is that fear? Is that real? What can I do to kind of make myself less afraid? Does, is, is, there, is there power in that as well? Yeah, it's what uh, some, someone did describe fear once to me as false expectations appearing real. And it's it's this this question, I suppose, of where, what, what's how do you quantify uncertainty? Because the fear of the future, fear of what's happening, in, you know, later on, you're never going to be able to say def definitively this is what it's going to be like. You have to make gut judgments about it. You have to, so it's quite hard to say if you know if if I said to you, don't worry, in a year's time everything will be great. I don't know that. But equally, if you say everything will be terrible in a year's time, we don't know that either. So it's 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 going to come down a bit to your what you have faith in, what you're going to what, what you've got this willingness to to put some some thought into. But you can have some evidence about it, looking looking at situations where other people like you have been okay, situations where you felt really bad and then you've worked back to being okay again, and that sense of trying to get as much evidence as you can to inform that gut feel, rather than just operating on without really thinking about it. Just I feel like things are terrible. Actually, try and make an informed evidence based judgment about. Yeah, about that there is there is definitely some some knowledge to bear in it there's not just a sort of emotion of it there's the, there's actually some realism some, some some experience that you've got to bring to it some some advice you can get from other people about that I was going to say it feels to me like it's very important when 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 you're experiencing this kind of disappointment or this loss to to particularly now to reach out to people you know and just um look for those forms of support you know it, whether it's something like this where we all know that we're not the only ones going through it there's power in knowing that other people are experiencing similar things which sounds a little bit weird but that that's that's how it is but I think for me when I've experienced sort of loss or or, or, or setbacks it, just being able to reach out to someone and just say this is what's going on for me and have them provide some of that wisdom and some of that perspective or just some of the questions that they need to ask you that you need to ask yourself can be so useful. Um, so I, I wonder, I'm interested, um, I know this, everyone that comes to these talks is so wise and so generous. I'd love to know if anybody else has got any tips for how they've coped with, you know, the disappointment or loss or sadness that they've kind of experienced. I, I, I suspect there's probably a lot of support we can give each other around this. Um, yeah, yeah. And especially, you... especially with the current setting, because it's one of the things that's happening is we're, a lot of us are experiencing the same kind of challenges, the same things. It's not affecting us all in the same way, but there will be examples of it. One thing that I think I think I might have mentioned this before, but if not, it's worth saying is that I remember speaking to a, um, a guy in the US who's uh, uh, wrote, wrote musicals for Broadway and, and they were he was talking. He looked back at the 1918 flu pandemic and what happened to Broadway during that. And he said, essentially, for about two years, Broadway was shuttered or disrupted and had real difficulties. And uh, but it's not like it killed Broadway because look at it, how it was, you know, after that, it's it's still it, it, you know, it bounced back. And so the question is more what, what's a realistic expectation to have based on the evidence we've got about how long things will take what will be be difficult and when we haven't of course had a have one of these sessions since the the christmas disappointment so it's worth mentioning that as well that I, I spoke to a lot of people after that who were very angry including like you know senior you know hr directors in large companies on on calls with the whole company talking about how much how angry they were with the government with boris johnson just it, it released this outpouring of, of of rage and a lot of that was not because of what restrictions were put in but the the, the, the stories of false expectations the promises it's all going to be great it's all going to be fine it's all oh no it's suddenly not that's much more of a problem and as long as we've got a realistic sense of what we can expect what we're looking looking to then we can support each other with that because we're all in it together we can kind of look after each other in that transition and um as my as my old friend Dougal Hine used to say the end of the world as we know it is not the end of the world it's just as we know it it will be a different thing but it, it's not the end yeah yeah um I think this is, I mean, this is a, a, a tough one that I want to talk about, but I, I feel like we, we have to. So we've been talking about um, sadness and we've been talking about d disappointment, which are, uh, you know, emotion, feel like emotions to me. 
but I wondered if we could talk a little bit about depression, you know, and, and, and tipping into that. I mean, how do you, how do you know that you've tipped into depression and, and, uh, and, and, and what would you suggest people do that if they've got a hunch that there's something a little bit more serious going on? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the first thing to say is, is do you seek help, you know, don't don't try and deal with that alone. I think that's the most important thing that you know, seeing seeing the GP is the first step, but talking to people generally as well, that that, that sense of trying to just recognise that depression is a bit more than just something you can talk yourself out of or, or, or think yourself out of. There are things you can do, but that doesn't mean that you can do it alone and, and nor should you need to. You shouldn't shouldn't have to feel like you need to, to handle something like that alone. Um, I, I think that the warning signs that, that I would look for is not it's not so much whether you feel miserable about things there are there may well be lots of things that you feel miserable about and that doesn't that's not a sign that you are depressed I, what i would look for is more how you feel about the good things because if you've got good things and you can't really enjoy them and they don't give you any joy and you just feel like there's they're not helping that's often a sign that there's a sort of a dulling of ability to feel that joyfulness and that the depression isn't isn't the same as sadness it's it's more a kind of lifelessness and, and it's a kind of inability to feel joy uh, rather than feeling sad so if you're feeling sad but you also have things that you're happy about that's 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 healthy that's 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 much more reasonable it's that sense of feeling like whatever happens it will just be you know it, you'll still feel the same way that's a sign that it's no longer about what's going on in your life and that's a really important point because people often think depression is a direct result of things that happen in your life but actually that wouldn't be a disorder then the point where it becomes a disorder is when those things are decoupled when the events in your life no longer influence the way that you feel the way that you feel is being driven by your inner state instead Stephen Fry used to talk about that of people saying that that Stephen Fry what's he got to be depressed about but no one would say that Stephen Fry what's he got to have cancer about you know it's a, it's an illness it's a thing that can be triggered by events in your life but it's just something that you treat as like okay I've got to take this seriously I've got to try and look after myself and you don't you don't just beat it by thinking positive you know it's 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 not really it's not really like that and so yeah I mean that would be my, my advice is try and catch it early as well try not to struggle on in silence on your own one of the the fears with the pandemic from a public health perspective is that people won't go and get help they won't get support that they need early and so we'll end up with a big public health crisis because people have been just struggling on and i think that's been a big, big worry for healthcare providers and, and and policymakers is just we're all trying to not use the nhs we're all trying to keep away from healthcare but actually from an NHS point of view they want people to come for help when there's simple things that they could be offered and to get that help early rather than feeling that we all need to try and be our own doctors you know? mm -hmm. I mean I mentioned I think I've, I've talked about this before but there are definitely there's definitely been periods in my life before where I've I've experienced depression you know, after my my mum died um, quite a few years ago now but there were a couple of books that I just wanted to mention that I found really really useful and I can put I'll pop them in the chat but one is um by um, Tim Kantoffer. Uh, it's called Depressive Illness, Curse of the Strong. I really liked that title because it appealed to my kind of, you know, I can do anything kind of. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good one for heroes like us. It know, is, like, exactly. Self-designed self heroes. Like, we exactly. really like that book. <laughs> so it's a good, that, I found that one really good. And then uh, there are two really lovely cartoon books by uh, Matthew Johnston. I don't know if you've seen these, Andy. They're called um, I Had a Black Dog. And he also has one called Living with a Black Dog. And they're lovely cartoon books. They're also, the cartoons are on uh, YouTube as well. And they're really lovely kind of picture books about how to kind of cope with depression. And, and they have this really lovely image of, so, you know, this black dog moves into your house and it kind of takes up all the space in the house and everything. And they just talk about getting mad at the dog. And the mad stands for like managing the condition. So taking responsibility for, for like lifestyle choices and stress levels and just thinking about actually you have to, manage this it's something that you know, manage the dog and then um accepting that it's an illness and uh and that you have to take it seriously so that old adage about you know well if you had a broken leg would your co-workers expect you to be at work no of course they wouldn't they would expect you to be resting and it's the same thing with depression and i remember that really resonating for me when i was uh, going through it and then the, the the d in the mad is the discipline to do the things that you know that will make you feel better so all those things even if they don't make you feel better at the moment so what you were saying about th th things that are positive just don't have any you, it's almost like you're cut off from the ability to feel anything 
um, discipline the dog on a daily basis by doing some of those things and the dog will get smaller and that's what happens that's what happens in this picture but the dog gets smaller and yeah. smaller it's, it's, a, it's a great book the other thing I would say is um, putting your friends on alert so I, th I found that it was really hard to make plans with people because I wouldn't know how I would be feeling in three days time or whatever but if a friend could kind of hijack me I'd just call me and if I felt well enough I would answer the phone that was that was great so that's what I used to tell them I used to say just just hide let's not make a plan just phone me and if I can I'll talk to you and I found that really really helped as well and keeping a diary about yeah. energy levels and moods just so you can feel yourself get a bit better which I think a couple of people have talked about in the chat yeah and some of it is the things that you find overwhelming are often levers for being able to, to to make some change so feeling that you're you're depressed because your room is such a mess or your house your flat's untidy actually that gives you a lever to think well if i can get my flat to be a bit tidier then that's a way i have of moving things internally for me so all of these are just things of like what, what am i paying attention to i seem to care a lot about that this tells you a bit about what might help if you can kind of work on those things that that might give you a bit more of a sense of efficacy of being able to influence it you know um i mean i think that there's a, that sense of loss of meaning i think is really important a, a friend of mine who had, had very serious depression said that when she was depressed it was like her her home was no longer her home it was just a a, a box full of objects mm. And it's that sense, actually, that's the quality that you're looking for is that sense of actually things are starting, the meaning is starting to, to fall away here. And, and actually making meaning is, is part of what art's about, is part of what we, we try and do in, in, in creative industries. And so whatever it is, and I saw you know, a comment, comment from Bex as well about the Samaritans, which is a really good shout, they're a wonderful organisation. But whatever it is, whether it's talking to people at support network, doing something that you, you, you feel good at, um, feeling that self-efficacy, that agency, taking the pills, you know going to therapy all these different things are tools that you can use to to try and shift how you feel inside yeah but i think that message of you know recognize that it's an illness and that you're not just being you know flaky it's you yes know, you've got to start with that and i think it really helped me just somebody saying oh all those things you're talking about that's depression because then it had a name and i could do something about it and and i think that was the first step for me in, in sort of being able to address it one thing I did find really interesting, someone once said to me, because I've been used to depression as a noun, like a th state that you're in, which is quite disempowering, actually. You're just in, an, in a state of depression. That's it. That's where you are, rather than it being a thing you're doing. And so, someone once said to me, oh, you're depressed. What are you depressing? And I was like, uh, uh <laughs> hmm. I think anger. I think I'm really angry. You know? And so it's worth thinking, what is this depression pushing down? What are you actually, what's it? doing for you is it keeping you safe is it helping you to to process something is it keeping you attached to something that you miss and care about sometimes just digging into what's the thing that you are that your mind is doing to try and understand it a bit better is really helpful just on the on the black dog thing as well there's a couple of one book i'd also say is reasons to stay alive by mac haig which is, I, I people yeah. take a lot of lot of solace from that the one that i really like as a, as a metaphor for it is actually from the flumps uh, there's an episode of the flumps where one of the flumps gets a cloud over him and just has this cloud hanging all the time whatever he's wherever he goes it's always raining and that's that for me was like that's it that's how i felt <laughs> so the flumps Maybe, maybe maybe have a lot of wisdom in them as well. Uh, I did not think we'd be talking about the flumps and Pootle and Perky or whatever they were called, but uh, great. Um, I, I'm sorry, I took us down a little bit of a sort of a dark alley there, but I want to, to shift the mood a little bit and talk a little bit about um, hope. So we talked that we said at the beginning we would talk about that. So um, I talked earlier about the fact that I love words. I wondered if you could just kick us off on this, this section of the talk by just giving us a definition of hope it feels to me like it's a very overused and probably misused word so how would you define hope yeah it's tricky with hope i mean i suppose a lot of this is about uh, anticipation of things being better in the future it's that sense of partly self the self-efficacy of being able to move towards it but also that sense that you can imagine a world a life a situation where you feel good where you feel happy where you feel like things things will improve and there, there's the one one of the kind of popular um definitions of it in psychology is i think charles snyder is the is, is the guy his his he talks about uh, goals agency and pathways and so you've got to have a goal a thing that you you want to move towards something that you think 
actually I can imagine, you know, I, I would like that. That's you've got to have that sense of sort of envision, envisaging. Um, but you've got to feel some sense of personal agency in, in, in that. You've got to feel in control enough of things to be able to push towards it rather than just I, I dream of being an astronaut, but I, I, I don't know anything that I could do that would be useful for being an astronaut. It's that, that sort of abstract goal is not helpful you need a sense of your own capability and you need a pathway to get there so if you can feel like there's a vision there's some things there's some skills and capabilities i have and there's a next step and a route that i can go that that i think is the sort of technical way of approaching home but i think a lot of it is as a few few people said already is is it's about imagination a lot of it is about feeling like you can look at the world that you've got the life that you're you're living and envisage how it could be different and see a positive view of change and i think sometimes of hope as being the opposite of fear that you've got the fearfulness of things were going to things are going to change i will lose stuff i will struggle i will think the future will be bad versus things are going to change this is great i i can't wait to see how my life will be because i'm sure it will be fabulous is there's two different approaches to the same uncertainty about the future and and that that question of how you deal with ambiguity is is a lot of the fundamental of this with anxiety as well it's it's um in the swine flu pandemic they did some experiments with people trying to help shift their default mode when you don't know what's going to happen what do you assume do you assume that things are threatening or do you assume that things are safe and and, and exciting and so helping people to practice being capable being comfortable with uncertainty seem to really help them allowing them to just practice not checking who that call was from or not reading your email for an hour and just see what just practice dealing with that what i think john keats called it negative capability that an ability to wait and anticipate things arriving to hold the space in yourself and so that that i think is is often what i think helps people to shift to a more hopeful state that feeling of of you know actually the the future might be better than i could have anticipated yeah i think it's that for me it's the um it's thinking about curiosity and fear as two two sides of the same coin you know you can wake up one morning with the same situation and you may have a curious response to how the day is going to turn out but you could equally wake up the next day have the, exactly the same problem but you would be worried about how it's going to, and it's the same problem but it's just a different kind of mindset or you know it's fear versus curiosity i, f- I found that trying to cultivate a, a a sort of culture of curiosity rather than fear has been really helpful for me um over the last few years um so hope, great to have it, but there, presumably there is some science around the impact that it has on our mental health and our physical health. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where it's sort of, you know, there's, there's science, you know, it's, I, I suppose a lot of it is to do with optimism. That's the bit there. There's the, 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 the science is more linked to that about the optimistic habits that we have in the, in, in the mindset. So that's where things like gratitude journals and, and the kind of way that you talk about your experiences comes in so this is martin seligman's work on happiness and flourishing basically that um a, a, a lot of it it's it's that the hopefulness is a bit more about context a bit more about figuring out a thing that you want and you you don't necessarily need to be constantly hopeful you can just enjoy your life now you can think actually i'm just i'm just happy you know so it's not like you you need to be constantly pushing forward and thinking what is the future of it it's that sense that the world isn't hostile that you have things that you can do that you can move towards it those things are very linked to to well-being and good mental health that particularly locus of control if you feel like the events and experiences in your life are in some way to do with your um, actions your your influence and and um, I, I actually think it's one of the things that can trip us up when we're dealing with you know, loss and grief and setbacks is to take uh, all the blame for that on ourselves to think it's my fault that I failed because actually sometimes that is a more comforting thing to, to think than actually this was out of my hands and it wouldn't matter what I did that feeling of powerlessness can actually be worse than feeling like it's all my fault I mean, feeling like this is all on me is in some ways a bit of a comforting story that that protects us from the randomness of feeling like I had a really good plan and then this pandemic happened and it's nothing to do with me actually it's just crap you know and so to try to think about what you want to have control over what you feel that you need to have control over but hope and, and, and optimism you know particularly that optimistic mindset that feeling of agency and self-efficacy they're very very much linked to, to good well-being and mental health. I can see this is already I mean, going on in the chat. Chat's got a bit mad with all of this. But if anybody does have any um, uh, tips on, on what's helping them to feel a bit more hopeful this week, I'd also love to. That would be great to see that in the chat. 
but I'd also love to know just to hear if people are feeling a bit more hopeful off the back of the announcement on was it Monday um, whether whether that is feeling you know giving you a sense of hope so if, if you've got any tips that you want to share that, about how you're feeling hopeful or if you want to just let us know whether Boris it feels like Boris has waved a magic wand that has given you a bit of hope it would be great to hear about that um, I wanted to share while people are doing that I wanted to share some a lovely project that I came across just the other day it's called um, the Hope Exchange so the, the website is projecthopeexchange.com, which I'll, I'll pop in the chat. But it's this lovely thing. I think it's, a, it, it's American, but it's a, it's a website where they just share voice recordings of people. So you can phone up and you can offer some hope via an answer. It's essentially an answer phone service. So you could say, I want to offer some hope around. Um, you can kind of filter them. So there's stuff around, uh, you know, kind of mental health issues. There's stuff around just lifestyle. So it might be anxiety levels. It could be I'm struggling at work. Any you know sort of problem, they're all sort of categorized. And you can either offer hope by doing a little 30 second recording that tells people about how you've got through stuff. Or you can go on to the website and find hope by just clicking on these recordings. And it's a lovely little thing. And it's so simple. And um, it's just great. You could just filter, you know, you could do it on a daily basis. You know, I'm feeling a bit lethargic today or I'm feeling like my anxiety levels are a little bit high. It's a really lovely little thing. Very simple. So that I, I found that and I found that really lovely. The other thing that I like to think about in terms of hope is that I think it's contagious. So I find if I talk to a friend and they talk to me about or I guess it's optimism, the same thing, you know, if they're optimistic then that rubs off on me a little bit. It just changes that little, those little kind of negative things that I may be hearing in, in, in my voice. Is that, would you say, Andy, that's, there's something in that? Yeah, and we're certainly influenced by other people's habits of mind and, and the things that they're paying attention to. I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm wary when, I, when I've done talks and sessions, I mean, I'm thinking back to actually that first session we did with the, the Dartington Happiness Festival many, many years ago of just the number of people who came up to me afterwards saying that they felt awkward about being at a happiness conference because they didn't feel happy. And so being surrounded by all these positive, optimistic people was making them feel like there was something wrong with them, like it was their fault that they weren't like that. And so I think we need to hold that space for people to to just feel like they don't know what where hope is at the moment. And um, I think of it perhaps as more like if you can see people like you going through things that you recognize and then coming out the other side of it. It's that relevance of experience of not, I, I'm talking to somebody who's always happy all the time and I'm not like that, but I'm talking to somebody who I remember being really fed up and now they seem to be doing a lot better. That That is often the thing that we need, this sense of, oh yeah, there's, there are changes possible that, that actually we're not we're not stuck in it rather than just feeling like you know i'm the only person here who seems to be having a rubbish time with the pandemic which of course we won't be there'll be plenty of other people who are having a miserable time too and that's some comfort in that <laughs> yeah yeah it always feels a bit perverse doesn't it to, to say that i'm really enjoying the fact that other people are having a rubbish time but i think there is something in that commonality isn't there it's, it's slightly reassuring um, there's some great stuff going on in the chat as well. Um, Abby, I wanted to to, to invite you to, to, to jump on uh, the, the screen with Andy and I now, just in case there are any questions or whether there's anything you want to kind of just alert us to from the chat that you think it might be good to pick up on. Yeah, there was one, <clears throat> there was one thing that came up um, quite a while back now uh, yeah. about motivation. It was talking about, you know, motivation is great and all, but how do you make the judgment call um, of when to cut your losses, particularly when your mood is low? Have we got any thoughts on that? Which, yeah, we sort of talked a bit about this, didn't we, about, about when to cut your losses, but it's that question of mood. Is, is the, the, the reason that you're thinking of giving up because of how you feel or because of actually the kind of sense of evidence and having a, a reason plan? So talking to other people can really help with that. If you're saying, I'm thinking about giving up and people go, no, no, don't, you know, it's great, you're fine, you're, you're really onto something here. That tells you a bit about whether it's your mindset rather than the reality of it. Whereas if you go, I'm thinking about giving up and then people go, oh, thank goodness for that. I've been watching you struggle with this. And what I really would love you to do is reply to my email about this new opportunity that I've got for you. That that tells you a bit about it. So some of it's about not feeling that you need to take the decision yourself immediately. And also you don't need to decide permanently. You can just say, actually, I think I'm going to just shelve this for a while 
do something else and come back to it you know it depends what what kind of decision it is but the, uh, and like giving up on i remember my, my first startup was uh, school of everything we were trying to connect people who wanted to teach with people who wanted to learn and uh, the business didn't end up sort of taking off and becoming hugely successful but we learned a lot and it's not like i walked away from that thinking i'm done with that i've still got this sense of th that was a good thing to do but i didn't quite figure out how to do it so i haven't just given up on that i've just got it shelved as like at some point maybe in the future i might return to that and see if i can have another crack at it so some of it's about not feeling like it's a permanent you know giving up forever uh, it's just i'm going to shift my focus for now i had a sense Andy, that you might also have a one day i'm going to do this box uh i think we might even have a couple of projects that look similar Yes, I mean, I think I try and I, I, I things things that I can do rather than things that I should do. I try not yeah. to beat myself up about not having not having done them. But yeah. um, I think the thing for me is that I have this sort of mythical moment in the future where I have lots of time. And I sense that that is something that you have as well, Julia, which is that point where the number of times we've had conversations where we've gone, well, of course, you know, next month we'll have a bit more time and we can think about this. And next month we do not. We have never <laughs> had more time the next month. So <laughs> No, the thing I was going to say, just to pick up on that point there as well, was that what I find is quite useful is to, is to kind of just check how I'm doing every day. So picking up on what you said about um, is the reason you're not doing this because it's a terrible idea or whatever, or, or is it just because you don't have the energy at the moment because, you know, there's stuff going on. And so what I find quite useful is every morning I do the kind of um, three things I'm grateful for, which, you know, the, the gratitude makes such a difference. But also I just write a sentence that says I am, and then I just write how I'm feeling. And then what I do at the end of the day uh, is I just rate my energy level and my mood level so and for mood I do it with it looks like a sort of weather map I've got like clouds and lightning and sunshine and all those sorts of things and then I just rate my energy level out of 10 and I can get a sense then of where I'm at and that, well of course I can't do that my energy level is like six out of ten of course I'm not going to like you know invent this amazing new thing because I'm just not there at the moment and I find that is a really good way of just contextualizing some of the things that I'm trying to do I'm not able to do it also ties into that comment a while back from Bex about rest being a part of yeah. productivity, which we talked about, I think, before. Like, actually, sometimes the best way to make progress with a project is to stop doing it for a while. Yeah. There was another, it wasn't necessarily a question, but it was more of, more of a comment that um, kind of going up, uh, you know, talking about going up against those no's and rejections and difficulties and, and how to try and kind of distance that rejection from you as a person against your practice and how to kind of manage that because I think that's something you know a lot of people you know probably myself included to kind of struggle with how to kind of distance yourself from the work that you do and, and who you are. Wow I've got answers on a postcard on that one. <laughs> and did you got an answer? Well it's something that I struggled with a lot in the early days of Mind Apples because it felt very personal it felt like this was my my contribution to the world and when people didn't like it then then it, it was it was rejecting me personally you know and I remember a particular low point when I, I wrote to a, a a psychologist that I really admired and asked for help and she basically wrote back deconstructing the things that we'd written on our website and saying how stupid all of them were and it was ironic because her research was all about how people being um, like discriminated against and bullied was bad for their mental health and proceeded to then do that back to me. Um, and it, it really hit me because I just felt like, well, actually, the sector doesn't want me. The sector's not interested in our approach. You know, the mental health world does just wants me to go away. And I think what, what helped with that was feeling that it was just spending more time on the things where there was energy going towards the things that were working. So actually what we, whilst I was knocking on doors of public health England and department of health and mental health charities, trying to get people to take up a more positive approach to mental health and getting loads of rejections, we were getting people like Goldman Sachs going, can we hire you to talk to our staff? Cause you, we think you're really onto something. And I was sort of thinking, well, that, that's just a way of making money that what, what we've got, what I'm really interested in is the, you know, changing the world. But I started to see that actually if Goldman Sachs are knocking on, on our door as a tiny little organization saying you've got you're onto something here i should take some kind of you know reassurance from that and put the other things into context and try and think about like actually this isn't it's not like i'm just stupid it's not like i'm just a, you know useless at everything i've it's just that it resonates differently with different people and it becomes more about them then about whether it's connected with that person and it's a bit like with job interviews they say what you're trying to find is a fit not 
you're trying to get people to to see your value they're trying to figure out if you would be a good fit for the role and you're trying to figure out if you would be a good fit for their role so it's if if you're rejected it's not you being rejected it's the combination of you and that organization that hasn't worked but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you um, but this is like when we used to talk to sales teams about this the way that sales teams do it is they figure out how many no's they need to get to a yes and then every time they get a no they ring a bell and go i've got another no i'm one step closer to that yes that i need so but they're all a bit mad so you know <laughs> that's a great one just to add to, add to that um you know i think it's about thinking about the intention behind the other person's decision. That really helps me. It's like, well, very few people make a decision because they really want to make it personal. It's not, you know, it's, so that has helped me in the past. Are they really doing it to make me feel rubbish? Or, you know, it's extremely unlikely that they are. And I find that quite um, a useful thing to do if I can remember to do it. So um, I'm conscious of time. So um, thank you, Abby, for, for jumping in and just sharing a little bit of the chat. It's, I, I do try and keep an eye on it, but there's, there's, it's just been so lively today. It's brilliant. So as ever, we will um, uh, wrap all this up and turn it into a, a lovely little blog. So that you, if you haven't um, managed to save some of the great links and the book suggestions and the podcast suggestions, uh, we'll get those out to you in the next couple of days. Um, to, to wrap up, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that are coming soon. So I mentioned that we were lucky enough to get some Arts Council uh, support just before Christmas. So um, in the spirit of Ali and I say, well, next month we will be doing this and we really will get around to doing this. We've got loads of really lovely uh, developments on, on the balance front to, to share with you. One is that we're going to be um, introducing some new training sessions. So we're going to be doing training around... Um, just kind of packaging up some of the mental health stuff that we're talking about so a, a training session on how to how to balance your mind and why that's important other sessions looking more about balancing the books so looking at how you can do business planning if you're the kind of person that thinks business planning isn't for them so a creative approach to that and then also some training around pivoting so if there are people who've who are thinking about changing or who are having sort of change imposed on them just some ways that you can think um, uh, successfully about pivoting and, 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 and shifting direction. So we've got the training coming up, more talks, but then the other thing that we're really excited about is we're going to be developing and launching uh, in May a balanced toolkit. So loads of video resources, audio resources, PDFs, all bells and whistles, kind of just little snippets of um, uh, brilliance and insight uh, that uh, some will come out of these talks and others from other bits of work that Andy and I are going to be doing. So do keep an eye out for that. That'll be launching in Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, I just wanted to invite Rene to, to join us again. Um, uh, Rene is the, our new hubster. She's going to be working on, on the toolkit with us in particular. Um, Rene, is there anything that you would like to ask people, invite people to get involved in over the next couple of months? Yeah, so um, as Julia said, we're developing the toolkit, which is going to be housed on a website. Um, and we're currently working at how that will... Um, be used and we're trying to make it as user friendly as possible. Um, so we will be doing some user testing in the wireframe side, uh, side of things. So when it's kind of in its skeleton state. Um, so if anyone would love to be a volunteer, it's probably about 20 minutes max of someone's time. We will do it over Zoom or be a discussion and you'll be playing around with the, with the baby site before it, before it kind of gets dressed up and looks great. So either let Julia know or reach out to us via our socials. That would be great. Um, and we can give you more details. Or pop it in the chat. You can see Phil's up for it. Zemaina's in as well. So that, that, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Renee. That's, that's brilliant. Um, and finally, just a couple of other reminders. Um, sorry, this is like the parish notices. Um, Sunday this week. You have no authority here, Julia. <laughs> The 28th this Sunday is the deadline for um, to apply for our new action learning set. So we're running four action learning sets over the next few months. Um, we ran some last year. I have to say, I think they were just, I mean, there were some action learners I could see on the, on the, the meeting today. Um, uh, we ran them last year. You get together in little kind of coaching groups of eight people. They are brilliant. They're such a great resource. So if you um, feel like you could do with some peer support, then uh, do uh, sign up for that. Rene can put the, um, the link in the chat there. Um, definitely the highlight of my last year, um, uh, one of those was, was working with all of those action learning sets. Great to see how they help people. And then the other thing to say is that we'll be back in a month's time with another talk. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that in light of Monday, we might be rethinking a little bit what we're gonna cover in March, but March the 24th, 10 a.m. And we'll let you know uh, in the next few days what the topic of next month's balance talk will be. So 
thank you. Thank you, Andy, as ever, for sharing uh, your uh, insights. Um, nice great to see to, yeah, great to be back with you this, uh, this week. Um, Abby, as well, thank you for keeping an eye on the chat. Matt for doing the tech. Rene for doing all things content and comsy. And thank you, obviously, to all of you. So I'd like to invite you to turn on your cameras if uh, you would like to. Obviously, if you don't want to, uh, no need to do that. And uh, um, I don't think we're going to try and attempt to um, uh, beat the December sign-off moment, which some of you that were here will remember we did um, uh, Auld Lang Syne to Slade, which for me was one of the highlights of, of, of my year. Um, today, I thought it would be fun to sign off with just a little pose that symbolizes hope for you. So I'm gonna do a countdown, a three, two, one countdown, and then I'm gonna get you all to just kind of strike a pose for hope. So on the count of three, one, two, three, hope. Great stuff. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for staying with us. Lovely to see you again. Happy New Year. I know it's late, but Happy New Year anyway. Lovely to see you. Take care and we'll see you next month. Bye, folks.